When one thinks about skiing in Alberta, one might think of iconic destinations such as Lake Louise, Sunshine, Marmot Basin, or Castle Mountain. Or one might think of smaller hills such as Nakiska, Norquay, or Canyon. Currently, Alberta has 31 operating downhill ski areas. What most people don't know is that there are an additional 15 hills that lie abandoned, completely forgotten in time. These hills range from larger mountains to smaller community hills. But regardless of size, these are places that people learn to ski at and have fond memories of. These are places that could very easily, with the passing of a generation, be forgotten forever. Thus, this video will take you through each of the following abandoned 15 hills. Note that some places have lots of information, while others have little to no information on their existence. Regardless, I hope you enjoy this video. With that said, let's get started. Number 1. Fortress The year is 1967. A brand new ski resort in the beautiful Kananaskis Provincial Park has just opened to the public. Snow Ridge boasted a double chairlift, modern day lodge, and runs of all different variety. However, just three years after opening, it changed owners in 1970 to the Greyhound Bus Company under their subsidiary, the Brewster Transport Company of Banff. Unfortunately for Snow Ridge, things were about to get rough. Although Snow Ridge had one of the most luxurious ski lodges in Western Canada, it was plagued by low attendance. Snow Ridge operated at a net loss on a full-time basis, even to the point that it was only open on weekends and holidays in the 1970s season. One year after Greyhound took over, the ski resort went into receivership. In 1972, the Supreme Court of Alberta decided to put the property on the auction block, and Snow Ridge was sold to the Aspen Ski Corporation, who subsequently changed the name from Snow Ridge to Fortress. Aspen had big plans for Fortress, including 1,500 apartment units, 300 townhouse units, and 300 detached cottages, as well as 400-unit hotel. If built out, this massive development would have been capable of housing up to 3,000 people. These plans obviously never came to fruition, and in 1979, Aspen sold the resort to a local Calgary firm titled Fortress Mountain Resorts Limited. This corporation expanded Fortress in 1979 with the Canadian and Backside Chairs, opening up the ridge to lift service skiing. In 1988, a new ski area was developed on Mount Allen for the 88 Winter Olympics. Shortly after the Olympics concluded, a private company called Resorts of the Canadian Rockies purchased Nakiska, and a few years later, Fortress as well. RCR operated both hills for around a decade. Unfortunately for Fortress, the hill had started to show signs of extreme aging and deterioration. Fortress suffered from declining skier visits and an escalating cost to operate, including maintaining the access road. Regardless, RCR continued to operate the hill, even doing a major overhaul of all the chairlifts in 2003. Fortress Mountain asked the government to take over upkeep of the access road, as well as 50% of the $50 million hotel tax collected by the Alberta government to promote winter tourism. When the province refused, RCR pulled the plug in Fortress, citing the unfeasible financial model of the ski resort. In 2005, the mothballed resort was sold to a former general manager, Zrinko Amuril. Amuril attempted to reopen Fortress for the 2005 ski season, even selling season's passes, but it didn't happen due to challenges with recertifying the chairlifts and concerns over the access road. He tried again in 2006, once again selling season's passes, until the government cancelled five leases held at Fortress Mountain, giving the company 30 days to remove its assets. Amuril took the government to court, yet somehow Fortress remained. In 2011, a new group purchased the decrepit mountain and set up a cat skiing operation with the eventual goal of reopening the mountain. Since then, Fortress has been the location of many Hollywood movie productions, such as The Bourne Legacy and Inception. As of the time of this video, the current plan is to reopen Fortress in 2023, reusing certain lifts and replacing others. Number 2. Wintergreen Robert Lyon was a visionary man. He started his career in the automobile business in Saskatoon back in the 1950s and by the 60s was running Trader Bob's used cars. His business had become a big success. He eventually sold that business and operated a more successful General Motors car dealership. But Robert Lyon loved to ski. Reportedly, he had taken several ski trips to the Albertan Rockies and eventually came up with the goal of building and operating his own ski hill. 
Even with all the success his automobile business was experiencing, Lyon chose to shed the security of his business and develop a new ski hill near Calgary, Alberta. It took Lyon a few years, but he finally found the perfect spot, a rocky mountain foothill known as Last Break, near the hamlet of Bragg Creek. Lyon purchased the 240 acres of land in 1971. During that summer, he hand-cleared many runs up the front side of the hill, where reportedly he tried to secure development loan to build the T-Barn Day Lodge. It was an unsuccessful attempt. However, Lyon kept persisting at his dream, and by 1974, had managed to purchase an additional 160 acres of land. By 1977, the access roads were built and snowmaking pipes were put in place. Lyon even sold 50 homeowner lots, which helped to repay bank loans. In the early 80s, Lyon Mountain became one step closer to reality when he installed a used double chairlift purchased from the bankrupt Tillicum Valley Ski Hill in British Columbia. But then the trouble for Lyon began as he ran out of cash. Reportedly, he only needed 1.5 million more to finish the ski hill, but he had completely depleted his resources. Lyon was not about to give up though. After numerous appeals, he was able to secure a $2.75 million loan from the Alberta Opportunities Commission in the summer of 1985. This enabled him to complete the hill and open it for business. Lyon Mountain boasted one quad chair, one double, and two T-bars. Night skiing, the ultimate ski experience at Lion Mountain. Ski our superbly lit night runs till 10 p.m. every Wednesday through Saturday night. Epre Ski, cozy up to the heart at our full facility lodge and party with friends till midnight. Nightlife at its peak. Night skiing this week at Lion Mountain. Sadly, one year later, the Alberta Opportunities Commission called Bob Lyon's $2.75 million loan. Lyon was obviously unable to repay the loan, and the resort was put into receivership. Lyon Mountain operated for four years under receivership until 1988, when four Bragg Creek investors bought the ski hill and renamed it to Wintergreen. The resort operated fairly successfully into the 90s. One incident in particular saw the Deer Run T-Bar de-rope and fall onto skiers traveling up the lift. The T-bar was never fixed and removed later that year. Sometime in the mid-90s, Charlie Locke, who owned Lake Louise Fortress in Nikiska, purchased Wintergreen. A few years later, Locke was reportedly forced to sell Wintergreen, Fortress, and Nikiska to resorts of the Canadian Rockies, who added the 18-hole Wintergreen golf course. But by 2003, Arcier had had enough of the small ski hill. Facing record low snow years and declining skier visits, RCR pulls the plug on Wintergreen and sold off all lifts except the quad chair for some reason. Throughout the years, several attempts were made to redevelop the former hill with condos, but none of these developments have come to fruition. Currently, Wintergreen sits in an abandoned state with an uncertain future, although the former base lodge is now utilized as a golf clubhouse. Number 3. Happy Valley In 1959, a local investor bought up much of the area that is now the Valley Ridge neighborhood and turned it into an amusement park of sorts. Happy Valley included a campground, trail rides, a 50 meter indoor swimming pool, go-karts, trampolines, and a three-par golf course. In 1962, Happy Valley became a winter sports destination with the installment of a Poma platter lift. This platter lift serviced four ski runs and could lift 800 people per hour. Happy Valley also boasted a modern snowmaking system helping it to make up for the low base elevation of the ski hill. In 1967, the entire complex was sold to an American investment group. This group invested very little into the complex, and it slowly fell into a state of disrepair. They tried selling it to the city of Calgary, but the city rejected it, setting it was too far away from the city limits. In 1974, it was sold to a different US group before Calgarian Bob Allen bought it in 1976. He ran the complex for a few years before adding the 18-hole Valley Ridge Golf Course that still operates. He later sold it to a Los Angeles group that planned to create a Hollywood North complex, but that plan never came to fruition. The pool, campground, and ski hill were decommissioned and replaced with the Valley Ridge neighborhood, while the golf course remains to this day in operation. The old ski trails can still be hiked at Valley Ridge if you know exactly where to go, but there are no plans to bring back the old ski hill. Number four. Eden Lake. In the early 1970s, two brothers named Irwin and Will Zeitzer had a dream, build and manage a four-destination resort on the banks of beautiful Eden Lake. 
The Zeitzer brothers had already experienced success with their construction company and built the first seven-story high-rise building in Edmonton, which was already the tallest apartment building in Canada when completed. With this background, the Zeitzer brothers bought a 170-acre piece of land off Eden Lake. Since the vertical was fairly small, only 87 feet, the Zeitzers moved over a million cubic feet of earth to bring the 87-foot vertical to a 203-foot vertical. In addition to this, they also planted over 12,000 new trees. Eden Lake boasted one of the few chairlifts in Alberta at that time, built by Doppelmeyer. The Zeitzers originally planned to add on a new man-made peak on the other side of the mountain, along with a hotel development, but these plans never came to fruition. Eden Lake operated fairly successfully throughout the 70s and early 80s. The ski resort kept modernizing the snowmaking equipment, which helped them to stay open when so many others did not. In 1977, Eden Lake even implemented a handicapped skiing program, which aimed at giving handicapped children skiing lessons. 1990 saw big new changes for the ski area, including a new cabin development on the shore of the lake. Later that year, the entire resort was sold to multiple Taiwanese investors, who pledged to spend $12 million to upgrade the facility. They planned to build an 18-hole golf course and a 100-room hotel. Unfortunately, 1992 brought Eden Lake one of the worst snow years it had ever seen. Citing this, as well as a record low number of skier visits, the Taiwanese investment group decided to permanently discontinue skiing at Eden Lake. They still planned to build the hotel and golf course, and for a few years the resort still operated. But by the year 1999, the entire complex was abandoned. In 2012, the old ski lodge burnt to the ground. Although it is now gone, almost everything else of Eden Lake still remains in the mountain, although it is private property. As far as I know, there are no plans to bring back any form of skiing to Eden Lake. Number 5. Mistahaya. Owned and operated by a local family, Mistahaya Ski Center boasts an impressive 100 meter vertical drop served by two T bars and a rope tow. The ski area was situated on the banks of a small river and featured eight runs three green, three blue, and two black. Even though the run count was pretty small, the runs actually looked really steep, and future ski development was even considered on the south side of the hill. Unfortunately, even though Mr. Haya might have been a really good ski area, the finances eventually just didn't make sense. Rising insurance costs forced the owners to pull the plug on the ski operations sometime in the early 90s. Even though there is no more downhill skiing at Mr. Haya, the place is still very busy and active, as it is a concert venue and retreat center. The lodge is still maintained and used as the base of this operation. From what I can gather from the owners of Mr. Haya, they would not even reconsider reopening the downhill skiing operations. Number 6. Aspen Heights Aspen Heights, which also went by the name Hardesty Ski Club, was a small, family-owned operation. Aspen Heights opened up in 1989 when the owners purchased the old Grizz chairlift from Fernie and hand installed it at Aspen Heights. The ski hill operated in a small scenic river valley until 2004 when it closed. Aspen Heights boasted everything from snowmaking equipment to grooming to a chairlift to a very nice day lodge. There were a few reasons for the unfortunate closure of the ski hill. The first being the owner didn't market the ski area very well. Apart from the town of Hardesty, no one else really came to the ski hill. The second reason was the snowmaking systems. Due to environmental regulations, Aspen Heights was limited on the water they were allowed to draw from the creek, limiting their snowmaking capabilities. And thus, facing these conditions, the ski hill closed. Everything remains on the mountain, and from an aerial view, the ski hill looks like it could easily reopen. However, there are no plans to reopen the hill anytime soon. Number 7. Pigeon Mountain Pigeon Mountain was the dream of a group of developers who wished to build a brand new ski resort located within close proximity to Calgary. The group chose several sites to evaluate, but eventually settled on Pigeon Mountain due to its close proximity and easy access to the city. In 1961, they were successful in building a detachable Poma lift, servicing four easy runs, and building a timber frame day lodge. Pigeon Mountain installed hundreds of feet of piping and a state-of-the-art Larchmont snowmaking system. According to the then general manager of Pigeon Mountain, the goal of the ski hill was to introduce more skiers to the sport than any other Rocky Mountain ski hill. In addition to all of this, the ski hill had a tea house at the top of the Pomo lift 
giving skiers that additional warmth before heading down the slopes. Pigeon Mountain kept expanding in 1964 with two new detachable Puma lifts, opening up a beginner terrain pod and additional couple of runs up the south side. The ski hill had big plans to put a double chairlift up the entire mountain. If this had actually come to fruition, it would have given Pigeon Mountain a massive vertical drop comparable to Lake Louise. In 1967, a serious accident happened at Pigeon Mountain involving the death of a 12-year-old skier. Reportedly, the hull rope off the main Poma lift flew off a pulley, launching the boy into the air and injuring another skier. Even though there was a thorough investigation into the safety of the lift, the inquest found no foul play and that the lifts were in satisfactory condition. Additional towers were simply added to the Poma lift in the aftermath to help keep the cable on track. Unfortunately for Pigeon Mountain, the 1969 ski season would be its last. Reportedly, the Chinooks had been especially bad that year, hindering snowmaking operations. Additionally, theft in the day lodge had resulted in the loss of 50 boots and skis. Thus, facing these challenging conditions, Pigeon Mountain ceased operations. The ski hill went dormant until 1979, when a new developer took an interest in having another downhill skiing venue. While the lifts were long removed, the base lodge was still in good condition. New snowmaking guns were ordered, and a Mueller double chairlift was installed up the main run. But by 1984, the second attempt had completely flopped due to poor snow conditions. The ski area sold the double chairlift to Canyon Ski Hill and Red Deer, and closed permanently. Sometime in the late 80s, another businessman developed a hotel resort development that included the original base lodge. While the idea of bringing back skiing on Pigeon Mountain was floated around during the 2010 Olympics, this plan never came to fruition. Currently, apart from the grown-in ski runs in Base Lodge, there are no remnants of Pigeon Mountain and no interest in bringing back the twice-failed ski resort. Number 8. Drumheller Valley Drumheller Valley was always a community operation. While the idea had been floated before in Drumheller about a small community ski hill, plans were never fully materialized until the early 1990s when the Drumheller Valley Ski Club was formed. The goal was to create and operate a non-profit ski hill in the community. By 1993, the club had secured a lease to the land and had raised most of their funds. Thus, they installed a riblet quadrature in the summer of 1993, up 80 meters of vertical. Drumheller Valley officially opened to much community fanfare. Thanks to the hill's northeast exposure, Chinooks had little effect on the snow quality. Due to low precipitation the hill got, which was an average 20 centimeters of winter, they had four snowmaking guns to help coverage on the hill. While the future was looking bright for the less than 20 year old ski hill, things were about to take a turn for the worse. In 2009, the town agreed to expand the ski hill's operating lease on the condition that Drumheller Valley Ski Hill acknowledge and settle its debts within a reasonable time frame. One year later, none of those conditions were met, and the Drumheller Valley Ski Hill lost its non-profit organization status. This effectively shuttered all skiing operations. A few years later, the land was sold to the nearby Passion Play, who intended to use the base lodge and parking facilities. They sold the chairlift to Big Bam, where it was never installed, and then to the new ski resort of Zincton in British Columbia. There are no plans to bring back skiing to Drumheller, although at least the chairlift is going to a brand new ski resort in Canada. Number 9. Turner Valley Turner Valley Ski Hill was incorporated in the 1940s with a rope tow built from parts donated by an oil company. The original day lodge was a repurposed City of Calgary streetcar. Apparently, the ski runs were never properly cleared of trees, which meant that you would be skiing down and avoiding stumps of the trees while doing so. The hill operated like this for around 10 years, until 1960, when big changes happened. The ski hill moved locations to a bigger hill and installed a $20,000 Poma lift. The Poma lift ascended 258 feet and had 50 platters. Residents even started referring to Turner Valley as Little Bamf. While the ski hill only had four easy to intermediate runs, plans were in the works to expand the ski hill with another four runs. While things seemed to be looking good for Little Bamf, there were a few big issues. For one thing, the ski hill reportedly operated on a less than a foot of snowpack each year, resulting in very short seasons. For another thing, the installment of the Poma lift had left the club rather broke for money. When an act of vandalism in 1964 damaged the Poma lift, the club decided not to fix it and end skiing operations in Turner Valley. Today, almost nothing remains of the ski hill. Number 10. 
Bones Shaganapi, Calgary Ski Club. The Calgary Ski Club was formed in the 1930s with the goal of teaching children in Calgary to ski. The first location was located near the town of Bones on the defunct golf course. It consisted of a rope tow and just a small skiing slope. In 1949, the city of Calgary gave them permission to use the north slopes of the Shaganapi Golf Course as a ski slope. Brush was cleared and a tow rope was installed. A few years later, the club replaced the tow with a Mueller T-Bar. Unfortunately, no snow making paired with a low base elevation meant that the hill was completely reliant on natural snow. Additionally, the city had concerns over what the ski hill was doing to the golf course. This all led to the eventual closure of the Calgary Ski Club in 1960. Number 11, Swiss Valley. Swiss Valley was a small skiing operation located only a few kilometers from Eden Lake Ski Resort. Built close to Chickakoo Lake Recreation Area, it was an easy day trip from Edmonton due to its close proximity to the Yellowhead Highway. The ski hill boasted a five-story brick chalet, a Doppelmayr T-Bar, and a rope tow. Swiss Valley had five beginner to intermediate ski runs in the wooded forest. The total cost of building the ski hill was just under $250,000, half of which was borrowed. After the second year of operations, the hill nearly closed down due to poor financial conditions until Dallas Hay came up with the goal of reviving the ski hill. And he did! In 1977, presumably to free up some money, the Swiss Valley Ski Corporation sold the five-story chalet to the local school board, who agreed to lease it back to the ski hill during the winter months. The school board had interest in the building as they had been renting space for programs such as science and physical education. The owners even hosted handicapped ski days, hosting over 41 students with disabilities and teaching them how to ski. Swiss Valley continued to operate in this form until 1988, when bankruptcy forced the closure of the small ski hill. Instead of being scrapped or abandoned, the T-Bar was sold to Fairview Ski Hill in northern Alberta, where it still operates. The land, including the five-story base lodge, became a Catholic retreat center. All that remains the former hill are a few overgrown runs in the forest. Number 12, Woodley. Woodley was a small, inner-city ski hill that offered residents of Red Deer an easy way to access the slopes. The hill was developed sometime in the 1960s with a rope to lift by the city of Red Deer as part of its Parks and Recreation Department. In the early 1970s, the city was looking at expanding the skiing operations and installing a T-bar lift. Despite some pushback, in 1975, the town went forward and installed the lift. The T-Bar was manufactured by BC company Harouche and was installed during the summer of 1975, though it actually opened in 1976. The total cost of the lift was around $27,000, with the provincial government contributing about half the money. The T-Bar was named the Opt T-Bar, which I don't understand the reference to. In 1977, the hill fell under scrutiny when the recreation superintendent admitted that he had hiked the rate to the day tickets without consent of the town council. Combined with additional work that had to be done at the T-Bar lift to make it safer, the hill slowly became a nuisance in the eyes of the town public. This was the beginning of the end for Woodley. The hill operated on an on and off basis for the next few years. This was partly due to the city council deciding that snowmaking wasn't necessary for Woodley. In 1983, Canyon Ski Hill asked the city council to shut down the hill and sell the T-Bar to them. The city refused, and Woodley continued to sporadically operate when either conditions permitted or the city council gave their blessing. In 1988, the city gave over operations of Woodley to a local ski club. However, the ski club didn't operate Woodley that year, citing manpower shortages, and thus Woodley sputtered to a stop. Today, the area is a local park in the city. You can still barely make out a few ski runs in the trees, but not much remains of Woodley. Number 13, Misty Sepi. It was always a rough ride for the small Misty Sepi ski hill located in Fort McMurray. The ski club opened on a small hill in 1974. The goal was to provide a downhill skiing venue for the city. The hill operated with a board of directors and 100% volunteer power. This maybe wasn't the best way to operate, as throughout the hill's five-year existence, they constantly struggled to find good leadership and manpower. In 1975, one year after opening the tow, 
the Hill was informed that the land was going to be developed and that they could lose their operating permit any day. This put the Hill in a tough spot, though they were able to continue operating on the existing land throughout 1975. In 1976, the ski club president had found the ideal spot and applied to the provincial government for a 25-year lease. The north-facing hill would keep the snow better and provide more variety of runs. It would be right off the highway, so accessibility wouldn't be an issue. The ski club wanted the city to provide the manpower and whatever assistance was necessary to build a modern downhill ski facility for Fort McMurray. There were several problems with this attempt, however. One notable problem being that the money the ski club hoped to tap into was already used up. Despite these challenges, the club managed to secure a loan, and in 1977, they moved the operation to the new hill. Misty Sapi installed a Doppelmayr platter lift, servicing three beginner to intermediate ski runs. The hill had a chalet and parking lots. Unfortunately, two years later, the hill was in another state of limbo. There were no volunteers to staff the operation, and without volunteers, there would be no ski season. Even the board was down to just four members. Facing these numbers, the club dissolved and the assets were sold off. It would be 17 more years until the residents of Fort McMurray could ski again with the development of Vista Ridge Snow Park in 1996. But Misty said he was a good effort and maybe under different circumstances could have thrived. Number 14, Grizzly Ridge. There is little to no information on the Grizzly Ridge Ski Hill. What I do know is that the T-Bar was installed in 1980 by Doppelmayr, rising 596 vertical feet. The ski hill was located around 25 kilometers south of the town of Slave Lake in the hills south. The hill operated successfully for a few decades, even running a bus service from the town to the ski hill at no charge. Grizzly Ridge had a full-fledged ski chalet and ski rental program. It appears the hill shut down in the mid-1990s for reasons unknown. Number 15, Devon Ski Club. The Devon Ski Hill was the dream of local resident Ethel Coates. While the tow rope didn't go up until 1955, skiers had long been using the slope, skinning up, and skiing down the mountain. Thus, when a brand new rope was installed, it caused quite an excitement in the community. By 1964, a T-bar lift was purchased and installed at the new ski club. Devon also experimented with state-of-the-art snowmaking equipment on a limited scale. In addition to downhill ski trails, Devon also boasted a 40-meter ski jump. Unfortunately for the ski hill, in 1968, the town of Devon erected a fence over half the ski hill, even though the Devon Ski Club had signed a letter from the town guaranteeing the use of the ski hill until at least 1972. The Devon Ski Club filed a lawsuit against the town, suing for breach of contract and seeking special damages of $24,000. And a month later, the town took down the fence and the Devon Ski Club reopened. The ski hill operated throughout the 70s and 80s until it sputtered to a stop in 1990, presumably due to aging facilities and declining interest in the sport. There was an interest a few years later in creating a luge track on the former Devon Ski Hill, but as far as I know, this never came to fruition. I really hope you enjoyed this video. It certainly took me many hours to create. If you have any information or photos of a lost ski area, please feel free to send me an email and I would love to feature them on a future video. If you liked what you saw, I would appreciate you clicking that subscribe and like button. Until next time, this is Skier72, signing off.